Okay, good morning. morning. Is it working? Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to, uh, to this session. Um, I was told to, uh, by David that uh, I should wait until everybody's here. So I think uh, everybody's here, so I think we can get started. Maybe we can close, close the door. So uh, my name is, is Ben Arendell. Um, as you would have seen in the brochure, I'm an international uh, tax uh, consultant. Um, and I've had well over 30 years of experience of international tax consulting. Um, uh, first with the accounting firm of Ernst & Young for 26 years. And I started my career in the UK Inland Revenue uh, in international division uh, in London. I retired from Ernst & Young just over four years ago and now I uh, do quite a number of international tax consulting uh, assignments. So I'm going to talk to you about the changing face of international tax planning and the effects on offshore financial centers, particularly in relation to the recent developments that we have seen in the international arena over the last 10 years or so. I think it's fair to say that uh, those developments have made international tax planning extremely challenging. As I say, I've been in this game uh, over 30 years, and it's certainly the most challenging time for international tax planners. Uh, in my presentation, I'm going to examine some of those international uh, developments and the effects that they have on international tax planning and offshore financial centers. Uh, that is not to say that offshore financial centers are only used for tax planning purposes. I mean, I think we, we all know differently. But certainly, it plays an important part uh, of uh, what international offshore financial centers are, are used for. So, way, way back, I think it was in the 19th century in the UK, Lord Tumlin, um, in the case of the Inland Revenue Commissioners against the Duke of Westminster, said that every man is entitled to order his affairs so that the tax attaching under the appropriate acts, and that is the, the income tax legislation, is less than it otherwise would be. Uh, now, that statement was the start of uh, the concept that tax planning and tax avoidance was legal. Uh, and that it was okay, whether you are an individual or a corporation, to order your affairs in such a way that you minimize the taxes that you pay. And certainly for many years, that is the precept on which tax planning, domestically and international tax planning, uh, was done. In recent years, uh, we have seen a blur between tax avoidance, which is legal, and tax evasion, uh, which is illegal. And in my presentation, I won't be dealing with tax evasion because none of us get involved in tax evasion. I'm going to focus on tax avoidance and how that blurring of the edges between tax avoidance and tax evasion has developed, I would say, over the last 10 years or so. So first of all, I'm going to examine uh, some of the concepts uh, that are being used by tax authorities around the world and have been for many, many years to counter tax avoidance. Because even though tax avoidance is legal, that doesn't mean uh, that tax avoidance schemes cannot be challenged by the tax authorities. Uh, and that certainly has been the case uh, traditionally. So there are different ways in which the challenge uh, can be made. The most common and probably the oldest is what we call, sure, what we call general anti-avoidance rules, GAR. And those exist uh, in many countries. Canada, the Netherlands, South Africa, Australia. And in 2010, the US introduced a general anti-avoidance rule, a GAR. Uh, 
Uh, in the budget in 2013, the UK Chancellor proposed that the UK will introduce GAR legislation for the first time. Uh, I think he said in his statement that the introduction of a GAR will bring in something like about $4.6 billion pounds of additional tax over, uh, over the next uh, five years. So what is a, a general anti-avoidance uh, provision? Well, basically, it's a provision that essentially says that if you enter into a transaction or a series of transactions, and the main motive of that transaction or those transactions uh, is to avoid tax and has no business purpose, uh, then the tax authorities can set aside those transactions and to charge tax uh, as if the transactions had never occurred. Now, that's a, that's a very general uh, uh, statement, a very general way of putting it. Various countries have different ways in which uh, they have drafted uh, the legislation. Uh, for example, I mean, I, if I take in Barbados, there is a general anti-avoidance provision in Section 29 of our Income Tax Act, uh, which basically says that if you as a taxpayer uh, enter into a transaction which has as the main motive the avoidance of taxation and uh, has no business purpose, then the Inland Revenue Commissioner can set aside the transaction and charge tax as if the transaction has never occurred. So general anti-avoidance provisions have never really been liked by tax authorities around the world because uh, the courts have never liked them. I think we had a number of cases in Canada in, in over the last 10 years where the tax authorities sought to invoke GAR to various transactions and lost in the courts. Um, the, of course, that has changed to some extent in a couple of cases recently uh, in Canada, but the tax authorities have never really liked the GAR provisions. Uh, they tried to get around that by having specific anti-avoidance provisions. In fact, in many countries where there is a GAR, the tax authorities very rarely invoke them. So they prefer to use specific anti-avoidance provisions. Uh, so for example, transfer pricing. Uh, thin capitalization, transfer pricing where they look at uh, where there are transactions between related parties, whether those transactions take place at arm's length or not. If they don't take place at arm's length, they substitute the arm's length price, whether it's in respect of the sale of goods or the provision of services. And then there are thin capitalization rules, um, which apply generally in a cross-border context, uh, where, because part of one of the tax minimization strategies in a cross-border context um, is to finance a company in a high tax jurisdiction with debt, and you load as much debt in as you possibly can to increase the interest that you pay, you get a deduction for that interest, and you make the loan from a low tax jurisdiction. So you get a deduction at the high tax rate, and you pay tax on the interest uh, in the low tax jurisdiction at, at a low rate. So countries have introduced thin capitalization rules uh, to say that you have to have a certain debt to equity ratio in order for the interest, all of the interest on that debt to be tax deductible. So very often I think the standard, the norm is three to one. And then there are controlled foreign company uh, rules. Uh, countries like the UK, the US and Canada uh, introduce, introduce those rules to prevent profit shifting. Uh, so a multinational in the UK, the US, or Canada, uh, setting up a subsidiary in, let's say, a low tax jurisdiction, and shifts profits into that jurisdiction, into that subsidiary. It's typically passive income. It could be dividends, because it's used as a holding company. It could be interest. It's a finance company. It could be royalties, uh, because it's a, a licensing company. Uh, the CFC rules basically say that that income, because it's passive, will be taxed in the hands of uh, 
the UK, US, or Canadian multinational, even if not distributed back to the parent. So that was another way of trying to discourage profit shifting. And then a recent phenomenon, exit taxes. Uh, there is a, a concern amongst G20 countries that because of the high tax rates that individuals pay in those countries, there is a temptation for individuals to move their tax residents to low tax jurisdictions, to more favorable tax jurisdictions, and that way avoid tax in the high tax country. Uh, in many countries you could do that without triggering any kind of a tax charge when you move. Uh, those countries that have capital gains tax, for example, um, have said what they need to do is to ensure that when that individual moves, that the individual is taxed on any gain uh, that's arisen on assets held by that individual from the date of, ac of acquisition to the date when the individual leaves and pay the tax uh, on that gain at the point of departure. Uh, the UK has introduced that. Canada introduced it about 10 years ago. And then you have anti-tax shelter legislation. Yeah. The UK, the US, and Canada, where they say that schemes that are put together by accountants, investment bankers, etc., uh, financial planners, which are sold on a whole scale basis uh, to taxpayers, that, that, that is bad. And in the, in the case of the UK, those schemes have to be reported to the, uh, to the UK Inland Revenue, to HMRC, and then they can determine whether, the scheme, whether to attack the scheme, whether it's taxable or not. But the important thing is that the tax authorities under those situations now have information about all of the various schemes that are out there uh, so that they can decide how to attack those schemes and if they feel that they can't legally and win, then they can change the law uh, in order to ensure uh, that those schemes no longer operate. Generally, anti-avoidance rules, GAR rules, applied in a domestic context where you have transactions typically between two domestic uh, taxpayers. It was always felt for many, many years, and agreed to by tax authorities around the world generally, that a double taxation treaty overrode the general anti-avoidance provisions in the domestic tax legislation, unless the treaty specifically says otherwise. The trend over the last 10 years, again, uh, led by the OECD, is to say that that is not the case and that that was never the case and that it was always intended that the general anti-avoidance provisions in domestic law uh, could be used in a treaty context and that the treaty did not override uh, the GAR. I mean, that goes against the whole principle that most countries adhere to, which is that the treaty overrides domestic legislation unless otherwise provided. But that's the situation that, that we're faced with, so that you can look at a double taxation agreement and you think the provision is clear, and you think that a particular transaction is subject to a certain rate of tax, or maybe it's tax exempt, uh, only to find that the domestic legislation of the source country um, could uh, say otherwise and could override the, the treaty provision. So that makes it complex and uncertain in terms of uh, how a particular tax plan uh, will, what the outcome of that will be, uh, particularly if you were to be attacked by the tax authorities and you have to go to court. Uh, Interestingly enough, the first domestic anti-treaty abuse rule uh, was um, introduced by Switzerland back in 1962, which is a bit strange because uh, back in those days, Switzerland was the premier, if you like, OFC. That was the premier conduit 
for investments into high tax countries. And the Swiss domestic law uh, uh, afforded that oppor planning opportunity. And not only that, Switzerland had probably the widest range of tax treaties of any OFC at that point in time. But presumably under pressure from the international community, even back in 1962, um, the Swiss introduced their own anti-treaty abuse provision, which actually still exists in Swiss domestic law. Uh, they have made some, uh, they've made some changes uh, over the last, I think about three years ago, but those rules still apply. And it basically says, in general terms, that if you are a third country resident, you set up a Swiss company uh, that is involved in passive activities, maybe it's financing, um, it doesn't have employees in Switzerland, so if you feel like it's a base finance company, and you use a Swiss treaty to finance into another country and use that treaty to reduce the withholding tax from the normal domestic rate in the third country uh, to, let's say, zero, because the Swiss treaties usually say uh, uh, zero withholding tax on interest, um, then the Swiss uh, can say that under the anti-abuse provisions, uh, their treaty does not apply. And then, of course, you have the OECD, and the UN model double taxation agreements. The OECD has been the driver uh, for the last 20 years of, uh, in terms of encouraging countries to introduce anti-avoidance provisions in their double taxation, uh, double taxation treaties. The UN, I would say in the last five years, has also joined uh, that bandwagon. So we are seeing more and more anti-avoidance provisions uh, in tax treaties. What all of that amounts to is the fact that it is far more difficult on an international scale to minimize your taxes. But there are still many, many opportunities. It also means that international offshore financial centers uh, that are used for tax minimization in cross-border transactions um, are going to have or to see the effects of all of this international scrutiny and all of these changes. Of course, having all of these mechanisms at their disposal in order to uh, try to attack and set aside uh, tax minimization plans in a cross-border context um, is not easy necessarily to apply. In a domestic context, typically you have two domestic taxpayers. All of the information is in the jurisdiction. The tax authorities in their income tax provisions have wide provisions to obtain information, even from financial institutions. Historically, in the international context and cross-border context, that has been difficult unless there is some kind of agreement between the two countries uh, to exchange tax uh, information. So, double taxation agreements were the main instruments for exchanging tax information until I would say the late 1990s, early 2000s, when the OECD um, launched its harmful tax competition initiative uh, and had three problems. One of uh, the initiative was to, to say that countries that were tax havens um, were bad, should be blacklisted. How do you define a tax haven? Uh, well, you looked at the tax uh, regime, if they had low taxes or no taxes, if they um, lacked transparency, if they had secrecy rules, etc. As we all know, that broad initiative failed to some extent because as a result of um, resistance from some OFCs and also the US, the OECD had to drop the ring fencing issue. So they focused on transparency and exchange of information. Uh, that initiative still lapsed until 2008, 
the start of the global financial crisis, uh, where the G20 urged the OECD uh, to get off their backsides and, and get the initiative going, uh, because they felt that the OECD had failed in their attempt uh, to have worldwide exchange of information, particularly uh, from OFCs. So the OECD formed the Global uh, Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information. I know you know, probably all have been following uh, the progress of that. But as a result of that initiative, the OECD has managed to create a global standard for exchange of information. Uh, they have a forum where over 100 countries are part of the forum and have signed on to this global standard on exchange of information. Also, they, the OECD has pushed the use of tax information exchange agreements because they basically say that countries that are zero tax jurisdictions like Cayman, Bahamas, Bermuda, BVI, uh, that with a DTA is not the right instrument for them to enter into for exchange of information and the tax information exchange agreement uh, was the way to go. And many countries have signed up to tax information uh, exchange agreements. I remember last year, Jeffrey Owens saying that, um, to a comment, the comment that I made, that it, the OECD had no plans to push for automatic exchange of information because currently the standard and the norm is exchange of information uh, by way, first of all, is bilateral between two countries. Uh, and also it is by way of, largely by way of request and that the OECD had achieved their objective, got the, the new standard agreed, got all of these countries to sign on to the standard, um, and so they had worldwide acceptance generally of the standard. There was no push towards automatic exchange. I think I said at the time that I was very skeptical because I've always been of the view that from the very outset uh, back in the 1990s, the objective of the OECD was to have automatic exchange of information globally, and if they could, to have multilateral agreements as opposed to uh, bilateral agreements. So, what we have seen in recent times uh, is that there has been a move towards automatic exchange uh, globally. First of all, we have the EU Savings Directive, which is a form of automatic exchange. We have since had FATCA, Foreign, uh, Foreign Accounts Tax Compliance Act, introduced in the US. Uh, we have heard uh, that a number of countries, uh, including the UK, plan to introduce the son of FATCA. And just, I think, about a week ago, or maybe a few days ago, there was an announcement uh, that um, there are, an agreement has been reached between six British overseas territories, Anguilla, Bermuda, the BVI, Cayman Islands, Montserrat, and the Turks and Caicos Islands, uh, to share information automatically with Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. Now that exchange of information is with respect to bank information, as is the case with, with FATCA, and as is the case with some of FATCA when they're introduced by other, other countries. But I think that's just the first step to automatic exchange on a much, much wider, wider basis. The OECD themselves have said now that their aim is to have automatic exchange agreements worldwide, and that will become the standard. Uh, so, uh, Jeffrey Owens' comments last year, I know he had by then left the OECD, uh, but obviously things have moved on uh, since then. So, automatic exchange, certainly in terms of bank information, is, in my view, going to be a reality uh, going forward. What all of this means is that it is no longer possible to, or advisable for tax planners to plan on the basis, and taxpayers to plan on the basis 
that in cross-border transactions, the tax authorities will not be able to get all of the information in order to determine uh, whether uh, the particular scheme works or not. Um, I remember when I first started in this business over 30 years ago, I never did, but I know um, some tax planners and some taxpayers worked on the basis that if you have six entities in different countries uh, in a transaction, then it made it very difficult for the tax authorities in the source country uh, to be able to, or home country, to be able to trace um, the, the flow of funds through those entities and so therefore would not have the full picture in order to determine whether tax was being avoided or not. I think those, those days are certainly uh, behind us. The other recent development, I think, um, that has significant potential uh, is the EU measures against tax evasion and aggressive tax planning. In December 2012, the EU Tax and Customs Commissioner, Semeta, announced a package of measures designed to combat aggressive tax planning and to tackle tax evasion. So we now have this concept of aggressive tax planning. We no longer have tax avoidance, legal, tax evasion, illegal. We now have this in between, which is aggressive, aggressive tax planning. There were 34 new measures announced, and these measures covered not just income tax, but also VAT. But of the 34 new measures, 14, 34 measures, 14 were new, and two are focused on non-EU tax havens and on aggressive tax planning. Because the issue has always been that countries that are dependent territories of, say, the UK, to some extent, uh, the UK has the ability to influence them and to influence their tax policy. Uh, countries that are totally independent uh, are not under those constraints. And the EU has always uh, been concerned that measures introduced by the EU to force, if you like, EU-controlled offshore financial centers uh, to comply with, if you like, EU rules and harmful tax uh, competition measures uh, would put them at a disadvantage to countries that were outside of the EU. And it was always, I think, the aim to bring other countries uh, into the same uh, regime, to create a level playing field, if you like. So, the EU estimates that EU countries lose approximately 1.3 trillion euros in taxes from tax evasion and tax avoidance each year. And of course, all countries are now struggling for revenue. High debt to service and tax revenues have fallen generally. So the measures are targeted at tax havens outside the EU and are said to be designed to encourage third countries to apply minimum standards of good governance in tax matters. That's another concept that uh, is introduced, the concept of good um, governance in tax matters. That actually reared its head for the first time during the negotiations between the Cariforum countries, which is the countries within the CARICOM, um, within CARICOM, which is similar to the EU, and the Dominican Republic. Those are the CARIFORUM countries. And they negotiated an economic partnership agreement with the EU. And in those negotiations, the EU tried to introduce a provision of uh, good tax governance uh, to say that any aid under that uh, agreement and any market access uh, will depend on whether the country um, has a regime of good tax governance. So that was resisted, it was removed from the EPA. It has reared its head in the negotiations between CARIFORUM and Canada. Um, Canada has tried to introduce a similar provision in the ongoing negotiations. So good tax governance uh, is something that is coming. 
And what does it mean? It says that, and it, it tries to tie it in with the definition of a tax haven. I was saying that a tax haven is one that fails to meet the OECD standards on transparency and exchange of information, and which operates harmful tax measures. So through the back door, the issue of ring fencing, low taxation, zero taxation, etc., cetera, um, that the OECD failed to be able to introduce has come back uh, through the EU. As I think um, any uh, advisor who uh, were monitors monitoring the developments, it was going to come either through the G20, but through definitely through the EU. And this is an attempt uh, to do that. And that, of course, has an impact on offshore financial centers, OFCs. And the test of harmful tax measures are those set out in the EU's code of conduct. And they comprise of five, five criteria to be used in identifying a tax measure that is harmful and unfair competition. So again, another concept of uh, un unfair competition. And the five criteria are basically the same that I, that I mentioned about tax rates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, transparency, exchange of information, ring fencing. So the proposal is that each EU, EU member country should draw up a blacklist of non-EU countries by December 31, 2013. And countries that are blacklisted should be subject to a list of um, sanctions. And these include renegotiation, suspension, or termination of existing double taxation agreements with such countries. And you get the situation where a country may have entered into a double taxation agreement with the new standard of, of exchange of information provision in it. They are on the OECD whitelist. They have been removed from the domestic blacklist of a country in Europe, and many of those countries have OFCs on their blacklists. So you negotiate a tax, a DTA, or a tax information exchange agreement, um, you're regarded then as an acceptable country, you're removed from the blacklist. Now the OEC, and those, the reason you're being removed from the blacklist is because of transparency and exchange of information, nothing to do with ring fencing. So now the, the EU introduces, reintroduces ring fencing. And essentially saying that if you have ring fencing, then despite you're on the OECD whitelist, despite you have been removed from the domestic blacklist, that you should be blacklisted. Um, now, what does that mean? So renegotiation, suspension, or termination of existing DTAs. Uh, a denial of access to EU public procurement of goods and services, or EU state aid to companies in blacklisted countries. Uh, revocation of banking licenses for European financial institutions that maintain branches in blacklisted countries. I don't say anything about um, if, you, if they have a subsidiary, but if they have a branch in a, in a blacklisted country. And abolition of exemption from taxation at source for individuals who are resident for tax purposes uh, in such countries. So those are the anti-tax haven measures. Then we talk about aggressive tax planning measures. And aggressive tax planning is defined as when an individual or companies exploit legal technicalities of a tax system or mismatches between national tax systems with a deliberate intent to minimize the tax that they pay. They say that aggressive tax planning is usually one when within the letter of the law, but does not respect the spirit of the law, and that it tends to stretch the interpretation of what is legal to the maximum extent and minimize the taxes paid by the planner, whether it's the international tax planner or the client to a level below what could be seen as a fair share. 
And we've already seen some of that in the sense that uh, there was the, uh, all the media publicity about a number of multinational companies that have a very low effective tax rate. And Starbucks was one of the ones that was highlighted that through effective tax planning, they managed to reduce their effective UK tax to a very low rate. I think it was mentioned as 2%. And they were criticized on the basis that that was not, they weren't paying their fair share of taxes. And as a result, Starbucks volunteered to pay the UK Treasury voluntarily 28 million pounds um, uh, to, make up, to make up for that because of the public and, uh, and media pressure. Examples of tax planning, aggressive tax planning are treaty shopping uh, and use of hybrid instruments. For example, profit participating loans. So for example, a profit participating loan is a, is a loan where the interest paid uh, is dependent on the level of profitability of the borrower. And that technique has been used um, extensively in the US, the US and Netherlands planning, where under the US rules, uh, the interest uh, is treated as interest. The, the instrument is treated as a loan. Uh, in the Netherlands, the instrument is treated as a debt, so as an equity instrument, and uh, the interest is treated as a dividend. And so therefore, the participation exemption, which exempts the dividends where certain conditions are fulfilled, um, uh, applies. So they get a deduction in the U.S. for the interest. Zero is holding tax under the U.S. Um, Netherlands Treaty, and then exemption from tax in the Netherlands on the basis that it's a dividend, uh, participation exemption applies, and no tax. And they say that that is aggressive tax planning. The fact that you're taking advantage of a mismatch between the characterization of a payment in one jurisdiction under that jurisdiction's domestic law and the characterization in another country under that country's domestic law, um, which has always been accepted as normal and acceptable, um, is regarded as aggressive tax planning. Uh, member states are encouraged to develop a common GAR. So we've seen that the UK has just recently introduced its own. Um, Netherlands already has a GAR. Uh, so other countries are now encouraged to develop a GAR, but to have a common GAR throughout the, throughout the European Union. And to review their double taxation agreements to ensure that no opportunities exist to escape taxation completely. So any mismatches between uh, the domestic law and the treaty of the two countries whereby income escapes tax in both countries, um, that's going to be looked at and countries are encouraged to renegotiate a double taxation agreement. And the EU proposes to establish a platform of good governance, uh, which will report to the Commission and the EU Council on the actions of member states in implementing uh, these recommendations. Unlike the OECD, the importance of that is that unlike the OECD, which is a loose association of countries, and the OECD can advise their members to do certain things, but they can't force them to do that. Uh, the EU, on the other hand, is a different matter. I think EU states generally feel that once the EU issues a directive, that they have to uh, comply with that. All of that is to say that we're going to see increasing pressure on tax planning, the further blurring of the differences between legal tax planning, tax evasion, and then this thing in the middle called aggressive tax planning. And we are also then going to see greater pressure on offshore financial centers. So, what is the impact on offshore financial centers? Well, I think first of all, before we talk about that, yeah, I think we should talk about, and one of the speakers yesterday mentioned this, uh, the importance of offshore financial centers to, to the global economy. Um, many studies have shown that OECs have played a significant role 
in facilitating the expansion of business activity globally by improving the availability of finance and encouraging competition in domestic markets. And if I go back to a long, long time ago, before double taxation, there were so many double taxation agreements, you could get a situation where a company in, com in country A invests in country B, no double taxation treaties between them, so maybe it has a branch in country, in country B, pays taxes in country B at, let's say, 50, 60%, so $100 of profit, $60 of tax paid, then there may be a withholding tax. But let's assume there is no withholding tax. It's a branch, no branch remittance tax. So then in country A, so that's 60 paid in country B. In country A, let's assume, as I said, there's no treaty, and there is no unilateral provision in domestic law to give credit for the tax paid in country B. So the company in, in country A gets 40 cash. And let's assume that 40 cash is what is taxed. And that's taxed at 50%, so you get another $20 of tax. So on $100 of profit between the two countries, you then have an effective rate of tax of 80%. $80 out of your 100 uh, is available for distribution to, to shareholders. It's a very simplistic um, example. But if we go back a long, long time ago, 50, 60, 70 years or more, that was the situation, which is why the use of offshore financial centers became important. Uh, because in that situation, as you can imagine, it was a hindrance, tax was a hindrance to global trade, an expansion of global trade and cross-border trading. So we would interpose a jurisdiction, jurisdiction C, that had a good tax treaty with country B. In order to minimize the taxes in country B, pay a little tax in the, um, in the intervening country and pay some tax in uh, country A. So if you like, that was uh, the genesis of the use of offshore financial centers. And that is still very much the case because there are uh, countries in developing markets where they have very high taxation they believe in taxation at source for every kind of income uh, and very high taxation, very high withholding taxes. And so to facilitate investments into those countries uh, and to minimize the tax and make it uh, profitable for those investments to happen, you need offshore financial centers. They assist multinationals to uh, manage the level of the effective tax rate arising from their global Operations. You can imagine if you are a tax director or finance director of a multinational operating in 50 or 60 countries with all different tax rates, different withholding taxes, some have treaties, some don't have treaties, and you are paying all of those taxes without any kind of international tax planning, you could end up with an effective worldwide tax rate which is extremely high. Uh, so the job of that finance manager, finance director, or tax director, is to try and manage the global tax costs. And the way they do that is through different techniques, but a lot of those techniques involve the use of offshore financial centers. I don't think that will change. I remember uh, when I was with Ernst & Young in, in the UK, advising UK multinationals, on what the effective tax rate should be around the world, there is always a rule of thumb that if you can get the rate down to something like about 10%, then that was regarded as being acceptable. Um, it kept you largely away from scrutiny from the tax authorities generally, because you're not really involved in lots of really, really aggressive planning. Secondly, on boards of companies, sometimes you have um, organizations that feel that uh, minimizing the taxes to the extent that um, Starbucks did to get your effective rate down to 2% is immoral. Um, and so therefore you would have to have that, that kind of balance in terms of, yes, you don't want to be paying 30 or 40% because if you are, the board of directors and the shareholders will want to know why uh, because you're eating into their, their dividends. But if you get it down too low, 
some of them may also still want to know why. So there is that balance. And I think maybe what's happened is that multinationals have become too greedy um, and have tried to get the effective rate of tax uh, down to a level that creates that kind of scrutiny and, and that kind of public outcry. Um, Professor Hajazi of the Rotman Institute in Canada conducted a study on the importance of ASCs to Canadian companies and the Canadian economy. Um, despite what many of the G20 countries say, they recognize that the use of offshore financial centers for their companies provide their companies with a competitive advantage. I mean, a couple of examples of the US and the Foreign Sales Corporation legislation. Uh, which was a tax giveaway to U.S. companies using approved offshore jurisdictions to set up their foreign sales corporations. Of course, that was challenged by the EU um, and the World Trade Organization. The U.S. lost, but having lost, they still saw the importance of trying to retain a similar incentive and introduce another incentive which didn't work. And the EU said that didn't work either, so they then uh, introduced it in a domestic context. So the US recognizes the use of offshore financial centers. Canada, in my view, recognizes that too, because the Canadian tax system has a provision whereby dividends paid by a foreign subsidiary of a Canadian multinational back to the Canadian parent out of active business income is exempt from Canadian tax. And Barbados uh, was the lead conduit, if you like, for Canadian companies to set up holding companies, finance companies, licensing companies to finance their operations around the world. And that income would be regarded, regarded as active business income. Um, and when the Barbados company paid dividends back up to Canada, that's exempt from Canadian tax. Um, there was always a lot of criticism in Canada, in the press, the Auditor General, uh, as to why uh, Canada allowed multinationals to have this benefit because that prejudiced the position of individuals in Canada who didn't have access to such benefits. Uh, and it was thought that what would happen is that they would change their domestic law or they would change the situation whereby that income would no longer be exempt. Instead, what they have done is they recognize the importance of offshore financial centers in that whole scenario, uh, in the competitiveness of Canadian companies, and they've widened that exempt surplus treatment to subsidiaries in countries that levy no taxes. So, for example, Cayman Islands, Bermuda, BVI, etc. Uh, entities in those countries can now access the exempt surplus treatment. So, on the one hand, you have countries like Canada saying that OFCs are bad. On the other hand, they are encouraging their multinationals to use OFCs to minimize their worldwide taxation. So he precluded, he sort of, he concludes uh, that if Canadian companies were precluded from using OFCs as conduits into the global economy, their tax burden would be significantly higher and they would be far less competitive. One criticism of OFCs is the fact that they say, and it is said, that OFCs do not have strong uh, regulation against money laundering. Um, I think many studies, including studies by the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners, STEP, has shown that that is not uh, the case. Um, in many cases, the most, they have the most stringent regulations against money laundering. Uh, because of the fact that they are concerned about uh, the risks to their reputation because they can be closed down in a blink by the G20 countries if they slip up. Certainly in my travels in Latin America, um, I'm amazed at the low level of regulation in many Latin American countries. If you're going to Asia, a similar thing. If you're going to Africa, it's a similar thing. Um, because of their size, OFC, OFCs have generally been able to provide right-sized regulation. Um, the onshore jurisdictions 
uh, how their regulation has become far too complex, um, unwieldy, do not facilitate uh, business. Sarbanes-Oxley is a very good example. Um, increase the compliance costs of companies. Uh, whereas the offshore financial centers like <coughs> Bermuda for insurance and reinsurance can provide strong regulation but right-sized regulation so that they facilitate rather than hinder business. And the hedge fund industry in Cayman. One thing that's often overlooked is the fact that RFCs are also used both by individuals and multinationals to protect their assets. I mentioned earlier that RFCs are not just used for tax planning purposes. Increasingly, as the world gets smaller, as more markets open up where the rule of law is not necessarily prevalent, the availability of bilateral investment protection treaties become just as important as double taxation agreements uh, in protecting uh, your assets. For example, many companies that invest in Venezuela and over the last 10, 15 years have used Barbados and Spain uh, for those investments. Not necessarily because we have the double taxation agreements that helps. But, also, but because we have bilateral investment protection treaties that they protect their assets in the event of expropriation so that they can go to the international arbitration courts and get a fair, fair compensation uh, for that expropriation. It guarantees that they can re repatriate uh, their returns on their investments. And that I've seen over the last, I would say over the last five years, has become just as, imp in fact, more important than the DTAs for many com companies that are investing in politically exposed countries, uh, where the risks of expropriation, etc., cetera, um, are great. And I refer you to the 2009 report International Financial Centers and the World Economy by Step. And I'll just quote one small piece from the report. The evidence indicates that IF, they say IFCs contribute to financial development and stability in neighboring countries, encourage investment, employment, and other aspects of business development in high tax countries. They have a salutary effect on tax competition, promote good government, and enhance economic growth elsewhere. So, that's the importance. What is the impact of all that we've talked about? Increased compliance costs, I think we all know that, on OFCs and uh, investors and service providers coming out of FATCA and son of FATCA and all the other uh, automatic exchange provisions that are coming into play. I would believe that some OFCs will have to evaluate the viability of continuing in the business. There are some OFCs which are, in my view, marginal and the benefit to them is marginal. The issue is, can they find a niche? Um, and if they can't find a niche, uh, are the returns that they get from being involved in the business, does that, do those returns justify the increased costs um, to them? Increased costs in terms of uh, having the resources to exchange information, uh, the reputational risk if they fail, um, because it has wide-ranging implications also in the domestic sector uh, if an OFC fails. Some of there will be winners and losers, I think. Uh, and certainly from the carrot and stick approach recommended by the EU to its members, because the EU also said that as part of the carrot that they should, countries should offer double taxation agreements to countries who meet is a good governance tax standard. Um, so that op offers opportunities for some countries who currently are finding it difficult to get EU member countries uh, to negotiate with them. Some countries that already have agreements with EU countries could find that their agreements could be in jeopardy. So there'll be uh, winners and losers. I think the current environment creates a high degree of uncertainty in relation to 
the possible success or failure of a particular tax plan. Um, and, uh, and that has its, has its own challenges. And as I said earlier, the ta tax planning based on the premise that the tax authorities will not be able to obtain all of the information about the transaction or the series of transactions um, in order to mount a successful challenge on in, to a, a structure or transaction is really, uh, in my view, a thing of the past. So, in conclusion, I certainly believe that the environment in which OFCs have to operate will become more difficult over the next five to ten years with increased scrutiny from G the G20, the EU, the OECD, as well as through the work of such organizations as the Tax Justice Network and the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. I mean, at, the, at this point in time, um, of course, it's fertile ground because uh, so many countries are struggling for tax revenues. And there's a tendency to blame offshore financial centers for that, um, which is not really the case. But that's the temptation. OFCs are easy targets. Uh, we've had a lot of activity from the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Even in Barbados, we've had uh, CBC from Canada send um, a reporter in disguise, disguised as a, as a potential investor, talking to service providers to see whether um, he could set up um, a company in Barbados um, to conduct business uh, in Canada and avoid Canadian tax, even though it's purely domestic business. And then, having been told that that couldn't be done, um, wanted um, advice as to how he could set up a structure with, a, with nominee shares or bearer shares uh, in order to hide a million dollars of income, untaxed income derived from his company. And uh, the reporter had a hidden, hidden camera. And that's happening in a number of OFCs. So I think service providers certainly have to be, have to be aware, aware of that. And I think OFCs need to uh, shift their focus from competing with each other to finding ways uh, in which they can cooperate in order to protect their own uh, mutual interests. Um, make no bones about it. The OECD countries, they do that. The EU countries, they do that. They, go, they don't go to any meetings talking about exchange of information, talking about international tax matters without having a common position. And I have yet to see any situation other than back in the late 1990s when some small OFCs got together to resist the harmful tax competition initiative, particularly the fencing issue. I have yet to see any other situations where OFCs get together and say, what is our common position and how can we cooperate in order to uh, <coughs> together um, change the face of, of these developments? Uh, there is, in the Caribbean, um, there is an effort to do that. The Cariforum Council, which as I've said is all the CARICOM countries and the Dominican Republic have mandated the Caribbean Export Development Agency to form a task force to try and bring together all Caribbean countries in an effort uh, to coordinate all our efforts in dealing with all of these issues, whether it's FATCA, uh, whether it's the EU initiative, whether it's the question of being able to ne negotiate double taxation agreements, all of those things. And I think that's a good start. And certainly our plan, I'm on the task force, our plan is to try and widen that to countries, OFCs outside of the Caribbean. So, I think finally, despite all of the challenges, and it sounds like doom and gloom, but it's not. <laughs>
I believe that there are still lots of opportunities for RFCs, the well-regulated RFCs that meet international standards to successfully navigate uh, those increasing complexities and of the global tax and regulatory environment and to be able to thrive. I hope I haven't gone over my time. <laughs> uh, any questions? You're all still awake, so. <laughs> no questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>